Solar wind swept clean this planet four and a half billion years ago. Earth thrived. Its natural elements helped it to flourish, and its bounty was for all to share. Then a life form of superior intelligence evolved, and for a while lived in harmony with the Earth. But paradise has been put into jeopardy. The motives are irrelevant. The consequences, severe. The remedy is written. The elements of life are clear. In this edition of Elements, the bright designer who's invented a new fold-away bike that becomes a handy suitcase size package. Scoot is aimed at the professional person who wants to combine public transport and cycling to help protect the environment. Conveyor belt homes built in factories could provide the answer to Britain's housing crisis. The modules are fully fitted out with kitchens, bathrooms and even carpets before being loaded onto trucks and transported to the construction site where they're bolted into place. Mexico City's food bank provides meals for thousands of impoverished city residents on a daily basis. Run by charitable organizations, the food bank offers fruits, vegetables and other edible goods at subsidized rates to people who would otherwise be unable to afford them. And a grisly discovery by cave explorers has uncovered an ancient dump of human bones. The unusual find is raising excitement and debate in scientific circles as to whether ethnic British tribes were brutal cannibals. But first, we look more closely at the tiny zebrafish. It may not be particularly remarkable to look at, but its appeal is more than skin deep. In the fields of genetics, the common zebrafish is providing crucial insights into human disease. So much so that it's proving far more popular in research than laboratory mice. The zebrafish has an extraordinary rate of development. It does in one day what a human embryo does in three months. A single zebrafish produces tens of thousands of embryos, all completely transparent. That allows scientists to watch every stage of early development, and in this way, Dr. Michael Lardelli, a genetic scientist from the University of Adelaide, has conducted crucial gene studies that could be relevant to human diseases such as cancer. Scientists like Lardelli can see very easily whether a gene is turned on or off, this allows them to manipulate the genetics of the embryo a little to see how it changes the activity of particular genes. Here we can see how the embryo is divided up into very distinctive units, not unlike the vertebrae and backbone. The zebrafish is not just offering an insight into the causes of cancer. Scientists are also studying the role genes play in the development of other diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and spina bifida. According to Lardelli, research is showing that the genes which control the development of the embryo are usually the same genes that have problems when cancer develops later in life. These are very important genes, as their role is to tell cells how to communicate with each other about whether they should be growing or not growing. Already, scientists have been able to identify a gene called presinillin, which is important in the development of the backbone and might be the gene responsible for the development of Alzheimer's disease in humans. So, does this type of research spell the end of the humble laboratory mouse, replaced by, of all things, the zebrafish? The sea offers science, medicine and technology a great many natural benefits that can be integrated into our daily lives. For example, how to incorporate natural sunscreens into cosmetics has become one of the most pressing questions in the multi-billion dollar industry. The key may be no farther away than the ocean. 
Like human skin, the ocean's coral reefs are extremely delicate and vulnerable to damage from the harsh summer sun. But unlike skin, coral reefs can convert or deflect harmful ultraviolet rays. The proteins that protect coral from ultraviolet light also give it its vast array of colors. If coral can deflect damaging ultraviolet light, then perhaps skin can too. Marine researchers at the University of Queensland have isolated these proteins in order to use them in sunscreens and cosmetics. And as the corals often appear in very attractive hues, it may be possible to get a nice natural mauve lipstick and natural UV protection at the very same time. Using the properties of coral in sunscreen or cosmetics could be some way off, but the results are promising. At this factory in York in England, homes are being built from scratch. In surroundings similar to modern car production, apartments gradually take shape as a variety of craftsmen set to work. The company Yorkon, specialists in modular building, were commissioned for an historic project, the UK's first multi-storey modular housing development. Architects Cartwright Pickard designed Murray Grove Apartments in central London for the Peabody Trust, a charity whose aim is to provide good quality housing for people in need. In the next 20 years, it's been estimated Britain will need more than 4 million new homes. But soaring land prices and a shortage of skilled labour makes that a near impossibility with traditional methods of building. Some radical thinking was needed. Yorkon had been providing comfortable modular buildings for offices, schools and hotels for two decades. Now there was an opportunity to create new homes. Steel frame modules complete with fitted kitchens and bathrooms, wiring, plumbing and heating were loaded onto trucks in York for the 250 mile journey to central London where a cleared site was waiting. Amazingly, in just 10 days, the 30 one- and two-bedroom apartments had been bolted into place. The entire building program for the award-winning five-story block had taken just seven months, half the normal time, and the factory-built modules are of far higher quality of construction than could have been built on site within a similar time frame. According to architect James Picard, another advantage of the modular building method is that on-site work is kept to a minimum, reducing the disruption to the local community. Tile and timber cladding was added, along with lightweight precast concrete balconies, which were simply clipped and bolted onto the steel frame of the stack modules. All the windows, sliding doors and other outstanding features were already connected to the modules back at the factory. Residents quickly gave their apartments a Mediterranean feel. The concept of modular housing isn't new. It's been common practice in Scandinavia and Japan for years but Murray Grove could spark a home building revolution in Britain. With an estimated four million new homes required in the next 15 to 20 years, the building industry realizes full well that speed is of the essence.
not bad considering this was a vacant lot just under a month ago. In the same London street, a former warehouse has been transformed into luxury apartments. From the outside, these flats in Shepherd S. Walk look very similar to hundreds of other loft conversions. But from inside, the view is very different. According to architect Simon Henley, a courtyard and landscape rooftop help create a community atmosphere. No two apartments are the same. Each one has been created to take full advantage of its position. The rooftop penthouse suites enjoy gardens and conservatories. The designers realized they had a unique opportunity to do something very different. Architect Ken Rorison says the shape of the building cried out for an innovative design that perhaps alluded to a more suburban way of living. It even included the classic garden fence so that neighbors could enjoy leaning over in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way. No expense has been spared inside these apartments. The fittings are of the highest quality. Architect David Mikhail was approached by one client to design her new home and he relished the challenge. Compared to his more usual work, refurbishing old London buildings, this job offered many more advantages and far fewer constraints. There were no existing walls to have to worry about and far less anxiety over finding things you hadn't predicted, as you do in most old London buildings. From the street, you see little of life inside Shepherd S. Walk. Only from neighboring buildings can you begin to imagine a community that's thriving on the rooftops. Recently, a food bank in Mexico City, run by a Catholic organization, announced that they were handling between 8 and 10 tons of fruits, vegetables and non-perishable goods on a daily basis. According to the Catholic relief organization Caritas, which means charity in Latin, some 95 tons of food are distributed to the poor by the Mexican food bank, while another 17,000 simply goes to waste. Each day, housewives like Martha Hernandez come to rummage through the discarded fruits and vegetables outside the market in the hopes of finding some that's still usable. Mexican charitable organizations run some 44 food banks nationwide, which are said to be the sole source of food for nearly 395,000 people. Products that can't be sold through normal business channels are donated so that they can be selected and approved by the institutes that the food bank provides for on a daily basis. Their principal recipients are children, the elderly and lactating women. The food banks also provide sustenance for orphanages and various other special homes. Although some 1,700 Mexican institutions donate food to the banks on a permanent basis, food bank organizers said the program still needed a greater participation of federal social outreach organizations. The HEB Food Bank Assistance Program works in association with Caritas. Since 1982, HEB has delivered 8,000 truckloads of food, over-the-counter drugs, freezers, and other necessities to participating food banks. In related news, Mexico City celebrated its annual Children's Day recently. Nearly 13,000 children still live on the streets and have suffered physical, emotional and sexual abuse. Many others have been exploited forced to work under difficult conditions at extremely young ages, according to a government report. According to experts, these problems take their toll on quality of life and limit the social development of the children. The director of the Casa Alianza, a children's aid organization in Mexico, Guatemala and Costa Rica, said the situation is not improving. 
An ever-increasing number of underage children are living on the streets. The Children's Day is a day for the entire country to focus on the problem and hopefully improve their conditions. Casa Alianza in Mexico houses nearly 150 children that have been abandoned by their parents, addicted to drugs or exploited. Under the care of this organization, they receive attention and shelter. And most importantly, they're allowed to be children again. The phenomenon of adolescent street children began in the early 1940s with an increase in the population and the beginning of industrialization in Mexico. The mass migration from the country to the city increased the social problem since the government was not capable of providing basic housing, health, education and employment, creating a marginal existence for large groups of the population. From that time on, homeless children have become part of the urban landscape. There are areas where the children meet to work, get high or just hang out. These areas are well known to the children and to all of those who work with them. According to future projections commissioned by the Casa Alianza organization, the number of street children in Mexico City is expected to grow to 20,000 in the next five years, unless something is done to address the problem now. London's biggest tour bus operator, the Big Bus Company, has been testing an energy-saving device which helps an engine burn more efficiently and triggers fewer carbon dioxide emissions. The managing director of the company was astonished and delighted by the results of the trial. The unobtrusive Power Plus unit was fitted to a bus that previously recorded 80% emissions, but was now down to a 33% emission output with fuel savings of around 15%. UK company PowerPlus developed the device which cost just 200 pounds to fit. If the technology on trial here continues to produce such promising results, it could be expanded to all buses and taxis, helping London to meet the target set at the Kyoto summit for a 30% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. The unit is also patented worldwide and is recognized by many authorities as the best emission reduction system on the market. And speaking of pollution, this was London on Earth Car Free Day, a public awareness exercise designed to prick the conscience of drivers and make them think about the damage their cars are doing to the environment. While there was no noticeable decrease in the number of cars on the road, drivers were aware of the issues. Now commuters can use a new mode of transport specifically designed to complement public transport. Scoot is a collapsible bicycle which is perfect for riding to the train station, carrying onto the train and riding for that last bit of the trip to the office. It takes just 30 seconds to fold up into its own suitcase size package which forms part of the bicycle's frame. That takes care of the unpleasant social stigma of having a folding bike with levers and cables sticking out. Managing Director Vincent Fallon, Director of Scoot International, believes Scoot is the perfect green solution for those who want to make a personal contribution to protecting the environment. Friends of the Earth agree. They believe that the idea of a fold-up bicycle is extremely sensible. It marries the bicycle, which is the cheapest, most flexible form of personal transport, with the public transport system, which enables you to go much further afield. Conventional collapsible cycles are bulkier because the wheels lie next to each other when folded, whereas Scoot's wheels stay as they are, making it more slimline. And finally, in Antwerp, Belgium, a fleet of these pedal-powered vehicles are being trialled as a pollution-free shopping service throughout the city limits. The riders take packages to pick up points at park and ride facilities where shoppers have left their cars. Code numbers open automated lockers to retrieve packages that were left there earlier. 
cities all over Europe are becoming interested in the potential benefits of human-powered vehicles. A hole in limestone rock near the village of Alverston in England leads to hidden caverns below the surface. Enthusiasts explore these chambers for fun, but when a group of weekend adventurers explored this pothole, they stumbled on a pile of bones dating from the Celtic era, which has cast a disturbing new light on ancient British history. Anthropological experts said that a femur or leg bone found amongst the 2,000-year-old bones has been split in a way that could only have been done deliberately in order to scrape out the rich marrow inside. By carefully examining the bone, it was discovered that a wedge was used to split it in two. It's believed that sacrifice and cannibalism may have been part of a brutal Celtic rite to pagan gods, and an elaborate prayer for victory on the battlefield. But they don't think the practice was common. If the Britons had actually been undertaking cannibalism as a matter of course, Caesar and company would have written about it and would have popularized legends of wild man-eating Celts, but none seem to have been recorded. Another theory holds that they were criminals sacrificed in large numbers. Experts suspect that the remains of many other unfortunate ancient Britons are yet to be discovered at the bottom of the Alveston Caverns. <laughs>